So following Jesus Christ impacts directly the way we behave by changing the attitudes that we have to a number of things. And today, in, well, in Mark 9, 30 to 50, today and, and next time, I hope, when we meet, we'll be seeing how the impact of the Gospel on our lives affects our outlook on ambition, our outlook on tribalism, and our outlook on the sabotage of both our own souls and the souls of others. And this is the way it works out. The second act of Mark's Gospel began in 829, chapter 8, verse 29, with Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah. From that point onwards, and we've said this exhaustively now, Jesus teaches his followers what it means, what the implications are going to be for them of following a crucified Messiah. Not exactly the Daniel 7 son of man figure that they've been hoping for and thinking of. And to put it mildly, the disciples aren't catching on here very quickly at all. The first time Jesus tells them he must suffer and die was in chapter 8, verse 31, at the minute they got the point about him being the Messiah. Yeah, well, the, suffering, the Son of Man must suffer, be, re be rejected, suffer, be killed, be raised from the dead. They don't get it. And they, they still haven't got it, because the second time that he tells them this is in chapter 9, verse 31. Here's how it all came about. Jesus is once again on the road. He's on the road. And the disciples are on the road with him. It's a, it's a travel conference, right? With Jesus teaching them, taking the opportunity of long hours walking along the road to open up God's word to his disciples. That's what he's doing, the twelve. So chapter 9, verse 30, they left that place and passed through Galilee. What place? The nearest geographical reference before this is in Mark chapter 9, verse 9. And that indicates they've just come down the Mount of Transfiguration. So here they are at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration. They set up on a journey that's going to take them through to Capernaum. And along the way on that journey... That having just happened, the transfiguration having just happened, the recognition that Jesus is the Messiah, having just happened, they move on now from that place and they're going back to his childhood home in Capernaum. After that happened, coming down the mountain, they passed on through Galilee. And the text seems to be making the point that they kept on moving. Mark is saying they kept moving on. Now, okay, uh, most of Jesus' childhood was spent growing up in Galilee, centred around the town of Capernaum. Most of his ministry has happened there. But Jesus is passing through, it says, Galilee, because he didn't want to be recognised. He didn't want the crowds flocking around him. He was trying to do something else. He was hiding for the purpose of teaching his disciples. Now, there's an interesting issue there. There's a side issue here, isn't there? We are not meant to be always available to people. We're meant to be not always on call. And sometimes God's purpose for us, the Lord's purpose, is for us to be unavailable. That's interesting, isn't it? The Lord was not at the beck and the call of the populace. And as he teaches, once again, we hear the unpalatable truth. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, they'll kill him, and after three days he will rise. It's the second time he's told them that now. And they're still finding it very difficult to take on board. They're battling to come to terms with anything like this. But it's the implications for them of following this crucified Messiah that Jesus is labouring to ram home hard with them. Why are the disciples proving so clueless? Why are they not going to get it even when he tells them as plainly as he's just done in verse 31b? They didn't have a clue, verse 32. They did not understand what he meant and they were afraid to ask him about it. They didn't understand what he told them. Every ounce of their previous understanding of anything about God stood against this and overcame all that they were hearing from the Lord. So the Lord was not getting taken at his word. And secondly, they were afraid to go to Jesus for enlightenment. They didn't want to hear this. This was scary stuff. Maybe that. But bear in mind that the last time this happened, and Peter didn't get the point, he was rebuked pretty hard. Do you remember? 
Yeah, behind me, Satan. You have in mind not the things of men, but the things of... Not, not the things of God, but the things of men. It's important to get that the right way around, isn't it? No one else fancied getting slated as Satan by him, so they were afraid at this moment to ask him. But they need to know this stuff they've really got to learn, because this point is basic to Christian discipleship. So Jesus will bide his time across the day's journey, and he's going to get back to it. Verse 33, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Capernaum, fishing town on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, place where Jesus spent most of his time as he grew up. He would definitely be known there, but he went privately into a house to get some privacy so he could safely expose this issue to his disciples. We don't know whether there were other people on the road with him because, you know, in the custom of the time, people would come along and just travel along together. He's sparing them a little, perhaps. They were afraid to ask him in such a public place. We don't know, but it's quite conceivable. So now he goes into a house, he shuts the door, and he says, right, guys, let's get to the point here. We'll start the discussion with this. What was the topic for discussion as we were traveling along, along the road today? Nobody wants to answer. They kept quiet because on the way they'd argued about who was the greatest. The fact that we follow a crucified Messiah impacts our view of ambition and that to which we aspire. And it does so in a very, very radical sort of way because we aspire to the opposite of what everything around us teaches us to aspire to, as followers of a suffering, rejected, crucified, ah, but raised Son of Man. So they've been afraid to pursue Jesus' teaching point of the day about all of this, not getting the point, being too afraid to ask the question, and now when the matter is raised again by Jesus, this whole issue of ambition and the impact of the kingdom of God and following Jesus on what we aspire to and are ambitious about, no one wants to answer. What were you arguing about as we walked along today? Well, now, in the cool of the evening and with a good meal inside them no doubt in the home where they're receiving hospitality because that's the way it was they're far too embarrassed to answer they had not been thinking like followers of a rejected suffering crucified messiah aren't you glad we don't have formal church meetings See, Jesus is not content for his followers to know the facts of the gospel. You see, he's exposing to them the practical implications of the gospel so that they can walk in those themselves. And that is the difference between an intellectual and a biblical faith in Christ. Here's the upside-down status ranking of God's kingdom and here's his main teaching point true greatness is different to what this world would make you think verse 35 sitting down jesus called the 12 and he said anyone who wants to be first there you go ambition that's natural enough want to be first anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all paul deals with this doesn't he he deals with this later on in the life of the church Demosthenes, wasn't it, who wants to be first, has left us? It's the opposite of the thinking of the kingdom of God. It wasn't Demosthenes. What was that Greek name? I can't remember the name. This is the burden of being middle-aged. <laughs> you forget you're Greek. That's terrible. How does that happen? I thought that was well ingrained. Who was it who wanted to be first? Well, there's, there's the homework for next time. Whoever it was who wanted to be first, well, he wanted to be first. And that's not the way up it is in the kingdom of God. Look, look at the slide. The way this world thinks and the way we've always been taught is that we rise to the top of the pyramid 
And the person at the top of the pyramid who's got his weight coming down on everybody else, he is the guy at the pinnacle. But Jesus is teaching on the kingdom of God does this, it takes the pyramid and it flips it. And it says it's the guy at the bottom. The guy who's prepared to be the servant of all and bear the weight of everything else, all the others coming down on him. That's the man who's going to be great in the kingdom of God. What's your ambition? Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Why? Because he himself was the servant of all and bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. This is the way of the Messiah, the genuine Messiah. The rejected, the suffering, the crucified and raised. And this is the ambition of those who follow him.